Well, hello there, good afternoon, and a very warm welcome to this next and final, in fact, session of the European Health Summit here in Brussels. My name is Maeve McMahon. I'm a TV reporter here with Euronews, and I'm very pleased to be your guide today for this session, which looks into the global digital response to COVID-19 and how digitalization can support health systems all around the world. Without further ado, let's meet our panel. Representing the European Commission today, I'd like to welcome Lorena Boalonso. She's the director at DG Connect, working on all things digital. Hello to you. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me. Great to see you there. Also joining us today is Bernard Kovac. He's the head of the Innovation Accelerator at the United Nations World Food Programme, which he founded back in 2015. The Accelerator has been awarded the best workplace for innovators back in 20, or this year in 2021, and in 2020 by Fast Company. It's a great pleasure to be here and to talk about such an important topic. And we're definitely curious to hear more. Good to see you there. Thanks for joining us. We're also joined by Karen Kalander. She's a senior health advisor and the chief of the Digital Health and Information Systems Unit in the UNICEF Health. And she's also a specialist in childhood eunomia, I believe, as well as digital health and community-based primary health care. Hi to you. Hello, good morning from New York. Happy to be here today. So glad you could join us from New York. Thank you so much. And joining us now from South Africa is Rachel Toku Apaya, the Director for Programme Advocacy and Communications for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Good to see you there. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Really excited to be part of this discussion. Great. Really curious as well to hear, of course, your perspective. So thank you so much for being with us, Rachel. And also we're joined by Caroline Bansbach, the Head of Unit Health, Education and Social Development at the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit. So good to see you there. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here and very excited to uh, discuss with you. Good stuff. And finally, last but not least, to get the, to get the take from the ground, I'm delighted also to welcome Professor Jared Kause. He's the German immunologist and the head of the Department for Epidemiology at the Helmut Center for Infection Research in Braunschweig. Good to see you there. Busy times, I'm sure, for you, Professor. Hey, thank you. I think quite honored to be here. Thank you very much. No, it's great. And the topic is fascinating. And of course, we're still in the thick of the pandemic. So I am really, really appreciate having you all. I know it's a busy time for you all. So thank you so much for being with us. And thanks to all our viewers for watching. So now, this panel, as you can see, is all about the potential of digital health going forward. But before we look to the future, I want to first see what lessons can be learned from the past and the recent past, and in fact, the last 18 months. So I want to start by asking our panel to reflect on the last 18 months and tell us about the role digital health played in responding to the pandemic. So we can start here in Europe and start with Lorena, our representative from the European Commission. So Lorena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's, it's an excellent question because in fact, it is the first uh, pandemic that we have in the digital age. In the past, uh, we didn't have the tools that we have today. So it was a big test uh, for all of us to see if we would feel the need to use them and their future. And I think that the reply of the need what we have learned in these 18 months is that uh, society is ready uh, to use them and that the pandemic has somehow forced us to use technology uh, in a way that helps. Sometimes we're a bit scared of technology. Here we have been able to show that it can be useful. Uh, without technology and, and, and the use of, of data, we would have never been able to discover the vaccine so quickly. This is because of the supercomputing capacities and the artificial intelligence that allow to uh, manage uh, and, 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 and play with the molecule. So that is uh, a, a first uh, big lesson that often we don't know. We said we were very quick, but we, we would have never been without technology. Uh, then, of course, in the European Union, we have done a number of things with technologies to help. Like, for example, we, we developed the the contact tracing and one apps to applications to help uh, the manual tracing of people that have the, the, the virus, which is something that is extremely painful to do, that has to 
to be done and needs to be done manually. So by digitizing this, we managed to, to help. Of course, it is something that is very novel. We are uh, still uh, using it and we are going to, to study the analysis of the impact. And then last but not least, uh, we uh, have developed this uh, COVID certificate. So a way to certify digitally uh, that uh, we have been vaccinated or that we pass the sickness or that we have passed the test. Uh, uh, and that is interoperable among member states and now more than 50 countries around the world. So this is, of course, something that is allowing citizens to travel safely. So these are just examples of how technology has helped and, of course, how this is just the beginning. So yeah. we are pointing to, to what else we will be able to do. Just the beginning, you say, of a digital transition largely accelerated, of course, by that pandemic. Lorena, thank you so much for those opening remarks. I'd like to bring in now Bernhard and address the very same question to him. Yeah, so it, from my perspective, and like the World Food Program, of course, has the mission of ending global hunger, but we're also partners in also this World Food Program Accelerator with other colleagues here actually on this panel where we're collaborating on innovations for digital health or pandemic preparedness. And we've got to talk about that. Now, I think one of the aspects that we've seen in the last you know, couple of months or a year and a half really is that the pace of change has accelerated. And I think this is really a recognition of the need of, you know, the problem. And COVID actually has uh, made a lot of things worse, in specifically in developing countries where people who have been doing okay have been now pushed into poverty, back into like hunger, back into suffering from health issues because of COVID and the socioeconomic effects that they have. Um, but then there's also examples of like, you know, there's good examples because technology has enabled the response to be quicker. It has enabled a digitization that would have never been thought of before. In particular, the, the drive for these innovations that we're seeing in like, there's good examples that we see inside the World Food Program, for instance, for, you know, digital digitization of food or food delivery programs um, that's reaching now uh, in, in, in the World Food Program case, like 35% of our assistance is digital cash or, or vouchers, which is $2.1 billion. And it's a similar development that happens in the digitization that not only will actually help people further, but, you know, I also have to say, like, we do have a lot of challenges in front of us that we need to address. Okay, a lot more since you founded that back in 2015. Thank you so much, Bernard, there for those opening comments. I'd like to go over to Johannesburg now and bring in Rachel and get your perspective um, and talk us how digital solutions were used to respond to the pandemic in Africa. Thank you, um, Over the past 18 months, digital solutions have been really instrumental in helping us track and monitor the pandemic. And not only has it helped in terms of the response to the pandemic, but really in terms of some of the ramifications of it, uh, when it comes to being able to send cash transfers uh, to people uh, to help in relieving uh, the impact of COVID-19. Um, there has also been a lot of innovation uh, that has been driven as a result of this. In South Africa, for example, um, there was a company that was working with the Department of Health to use WhatsApp uh, for sharing information around general health issues. And they were able to quickly adapt that uh, to help disseminate information around COVID. And that was adopted by WHO. In Ghana, there was another you know, local um, software company that was able to adapt their platform to allow the country to collect COVID symptoms across the country. And they were able to do it in a way that was really responsive uh, to the local context. So there have been many examples of the digital technology being used to drive innovation that has benefited the COVID response, but also more broadly, some of the other social um, issues that the continent is dealing with. Okay, Rachel, well, we've lots more questions for you, but we'll come back to you in just a couple of minutes. And now bring in Professor Gerhard Kauza, who along, of course, with his team has had first-hand experience over the last 18 months of implementing digital innovation on the ground in, in North Germany. So, Professor Kauza, can you just talk us through uh, the experience of the last 18 months for yourself and your team? The activities was indeed to deploy SOMAS 
This is a digital system that we had developed jointly with colleagues in Nigeria during the Ebola epidemic. And it now turned, in, turned out to be very, very useful in managing the response to the pandemic. And um, we're a bit overwhelmed, of course, by the many countries that now started to deploy SOMAS. Nigeria has managed to roll out SOMAS in all of their 755 um, local health departments, the same as to Ghana. Fiji joined in, and now the big news is that the system that was originally developed together with colleagues in Africa for the needs in Africa has now been exported to Europe and is now used in Germany and France and Switzerland to contain the pandemic. So that's, I think, is a very nice example of cross-continental cooperation and technology transfer from the south to the north, so to speak. Uh, but I must also say um, that if you look at the digitalization boost, I would like to call it that we learned during the pandemic, there's, it's not all so uh, optimistic. Uh, in many, many other areas, we have a, not, a lot of problems. Um, if you look, for example, at the European Union, every nation in the European Union has its own digital system for disease surveillance. And to be honest and frank, that's ridiculous because the diseases behave very much the same. The same data has to be collected. Uh, they have to be sent standardized and standardized way to ECDC. Um, the communication uh, from a case in France to Stockholm to the ECDC is faster than from, uh, from let's say, uh, Wissenburg in French border to the next German city in Karlsruhe, only 30 kilometers away. And that is something that needs to be stopped because uh, containing a pandemic is about not only vertical communication hierarchically, but also horizontal network communication. Okay, Professor. Well, that's something we'll certainly address uh, to Lorraine, our representative from the European Commission, in just a minute. Uh, but first, let's bring in Karen Callender to get her take. She's, of course, the Senior Health Advisor and Chief of Digital Health at UNICEF to talk us through her um, takeaways over the last 18 months when it comes to using uh, digital. Sure. Thank you. I mean, it's no question that the last 18 months have created sort of a huge digital leap across the whole world. Everything had to go digital when countries went into lockdown and and um, not the least the health system. And of course, this doesn't just mean that there was all of a sudden a huge need for data, but also the need for delivering health services remotely, training health workers remotely, all the areas, you know, bringing people to the routine services, but trying to do that remotely. We've seen um, innovations happening in all these areas. And what we know from before, and which we unfortunately haven't really learned from much, is the epidemic in West Africa, the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, where the, the, that part of the world was faced with a very similar situation that all of a sudden there was a huge need for digital innovation and digital technologies to combat the, the epidemic. And we knew from that experience, those of us who were involved in that, that innovating at the time of an epidemic or a pandemic is really not the, the, the best um, situation. Innovating requires iteration. It requires going back and forth, trying out things on a small scale, learning from that experience, changing the, the requirements. And we had no time to do that back then. And yet, we're still at the same spot again 18 months ago where we had to do that over again, throwing in digital solutions where we could, countries sort of scrambling to find solutions that could address the most urgent needs. And we see that today, that we have now a huge sort of uptake of digital solutions in countries that previously were very... Um, analog in their health systems. But it doesn't mean that those solutions and systems are necessarily implemented in a way that is sustainable in line with standards and best practices where health workers are actually trained to properly use these systems. That takes time. And so I think we have a lot of work ahead of us to go back and like support countries to now reconfigure these systems to improve them to actually be more integrated into their health information systems into routine practices because what we see is a large amount of siloed systems that only address covid but that does not link with the existing platforms or systems that countries have in place 
And what we also saw was this huge refocus of digital sort of investments from, from having had long-term plans, long-term strategies for how to build sort of a, a solid digital health ecosystem in the country to this urgent sort of um, reshift to, to COVID focus. And that means that a lot of the we need to now go back and, and make sure that we keep focusing on the long-term plans because that's how we build health systems. It's not to bring in isolated solutions for one disease. How do we make sure that we now build on this momentum so that the COVID solutions can be expanded to include routine immunizations? How do we build them to link with patient registries and sort of integrate and bring this back into a to a solid health information system. And that's going to be a huge task because many of the solutions that were introduced are not set up in a way to be interoperable. And I think that's what we now experience from having had to do this in such a rushed manner. And I just wish for the future that we again try to learn from this and build those systems beforehand so that they are resilient when a pandemic hit the next time. Absolutely, so that we're much better prepared. Well, we look towards the future in just a minute. But first, let's bring in Caroline Bansbach and get the take of her, the head of unit of health there at the Deutsche Gesellschaft for Internationale Zusammenarbeit. Um, what's your take? Yeah, I think from the perspective of GIZ and the German Development Corporation, we have seen a lot of progress in the field of digital health and a really rapid introduction of digital tools in our partner countries in general, and also in the field of pandemic prevention and response. Um, according to the Digital Public Goods Alliance, uh, 37 digital public goods which aim to achieve SDG 3, so the good health and well-being related uh, uh, goals are being deployed in 240 countries around the world and um, this includes uh, for example digital tools like SOMAS uh, mentioned already, Corona Safe, Santi IMS, HIMIS, mobile data collection just to mention a few. So tools which support surveillance, outbreak response management, analysis, bed allocation, patient shifting or immunization management for COVID-19, immunization and other. Uh, currently, like 160 COVID-19 related digital health projects in like 60 countries are registered in the Digital Health Atlas platform of um, WHO. So all this demonstrates that the digital landscape in the health sector is evolving at a very fast pace. And of course, the pandemic crisis has reinforced the trend significantly. However, we have also seen that some uncoordinated development uh, and introduction of digital solutions can lead to quite some fragmentation, which at the longer run is not such sustainable and will not develop sustainable health system. So um, it is very important to recognize basic concepts such as the digital investment principles, for example, and open source digital public goods. These are crucial agreements that can support concerted action. On the level of crisis response readiness and of uh, digital readiness, the level rise a lot in our partner countries. So technical assistance is really very important for those who don't have the right tools and infrastructure in place. But we also see where the challenges are and um, they are really, really huge. I think coordination between the different actors is really crucial and we need to support governments, governments to develop national digital health policies as a whole and um, yeah, and to, to coordinate globally uh, for concerted action. To coordinate globally for concerted action. Okay, thank you so much, um, Caroline, for those opening remarks. And before we dig in a little more, I'd like to bring in Lorena from the Commission just to get her reaction to what you've heard so far. I mean, we heard the words like fragmentation there, you know, Karen didn't say it so specifically, but it does appear that we've just been in firefighting mode for the last 18 months and we weren't prepared for this pandemic. So how would you react, Lorena, so far to what's been said? I must agree with most of what has been said. It is true that uh, we had sometimes to, I would not say improvise, because the tools were there, but we had often tools that we have never put into place and certainly not at such large scale. So uh, it uh, put all of us uh, in a situation to say, okay, 
And what we have been praising doesn't really work in fact. Uh, and I think that unfortunately we learn, uh, I say unfortunately because it could have been better uh, to uh, learn certain things in advance. Uh, uh, from our point of view, it was more a situation where things that we have been saying we were able to show them. I think that the fact that there is fragmentation is something that, that we know uh, and on which we have been working for many years, uh, in terms, for example, of interoperability, we have a recommendation on, on interoperability, what, what should be used for health records, uh, uh, but still, it's when you realize that you need to interpret that uh, suddenly it's okay, well, <laughs> they were right. Now, um, we are, of course, first we have to fix certain things, uh, and for others, we are working, we were already working in fixing them. Let me give you an example, uh, the COVID certificate, which is something that uh, is a big success uh, because it has gone beyond the European Union. Uh, it's being used, uh, as I was saying, for more than 50 countries in the world. Uh, uh, part of the success is what some of the other speakers mentioned. First of all, interoperability. We build it on, based on the same specific uh, technical specifications and, and common standards from the beginning. So it was it's, it is interoperable everywhere because we managed to agree all member states are now in more countries on using exactly the same standards. Of course, you will tell me well for a COVID certificate maybe that's an easy thing. It was not that easy, uh, but it gives hopes for for other things. Uh, now, uh, of course, in the future, uh, because these things were were, were mentioned, uh, what we are building on now is on uh, creating what we call the European Health Data Spaces, and a legislative proposal will come next year uh, that comes together with many others on how to deal with data, data governance. So what are the rules, who shares what with whom, uh, how to ensure interoperability. So we are coming with this legislative proposal that will allow us to build the European Health Data Spaces and uh, we are, of course, funding them. Huh? But I think that I, I agree on the fact that the most important lesson of what we really saw is the importance of data and everything that comes around, in, in particular with health data privacy issues. We have to deal with that. Uh, we have to issue recommendations. We have to even by design in our technical solution take into account the privacy aspects uh, uh, we have to deal with interoperability, we have to deal with the use of private data by the public sector. What are the rules of the game there? Can we, should we, how to do it, with what uh, assurances, uh, and as I was saying, also governance. For the, uh, and I finish here, for the new COVID certificate, something that was key of the success, and I will agree with, I think it was Caroline who said it, is that everything is open source. Absolutely everything. Everything is open source. So, from the uh, specifications to the uh, validity applications, you can download the verification app and check the COVID certificate. So, everything open source is, is, is key. So, I will stop here because I get very excited when I talk about this. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Okay, Lorena, we'll stop you there and maybe bring in um, Bernard to get his take on, on what you've been saying. And also a point, I think, Bernard, that's very important for you is that of collaboration and partnership as key drivers to scale innovation. Can you tell us how agencies and public and private sectors have been collaborating and how you hope they will so as well going forward? Absolutely. And I think this is particularly important in the innovation space. And as we're talking about, like finding the best and brightest ideas and innovators on the globe that can actually be scaled uh, and have impact for people, specifically when we also speak about like developing countries. Now, and we as the World Food Product Innovation Accelerator have been working in partnerships and co-creating with different other governments and uh, agencies. Like in one thing, I want to highlight in particular like the Digital Health Accelerator and just recently we launched this Digital Health Innovation Accelerator program uh, which is powered by the World Food Program Innovation Accelerator in the DigiLab that's jointly led by the German uh, Ministry of Economic Development, uh, um, KFW and also GSZ and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And this is something which just highlights the power of collaboration, the power of bringing multiple people and organizations together of how can all of us actually achieve 
more goals and actually something that's bigger than the sum of the parts. And that accelerator program specifically works, and we've so far identified and shortlisted scalable digital solutions uh, that use open um, open stain standards towards like creating of global goods. And Carolyn was talking about this, where like how might we actually uh, support pandemic preparedness capabilities in low and middle income countries? Like one of the elements, and this is always a question about is this private sector? Is this public sector one belief that's there and like in specific scalable solutions can be this digital public goods so things that are accessible to governments to other people so that you can actually replicate this and benefit from that and in particular when you think about uh goods or innovation that are funded by you know could be public funds or foundations that's where it does make sense like how can we actually make this replicable or actually have more people benefit i think there's a power also of when you're working in the social impact space in particular and a lot of times what we care about is you know helping vulnerable populations making sure that nobody's left behind and so in order to do that this is where we need to actually focus on that. In in particular, as we think about the COVID-19 vaccination campaigns, you know, we need to leverage digital solutions because we see that the step change, you know, in developed countries in particular, how can we have the same efficiency and effectiveness of those programs? In particular, when you think about like, you know, technical assessments in Western and Central Africa, like particular countries that you're talking about. And this is particular an element where I can only say, we need more collaboration. We need the best and brightest ideas to come forward. And together, we can have a lot more impact. Well, let's see if we hear some of the best and brightest solutions on this panel, because on that note of the global vaccination, the World Health Organization has said 11 billion doses would be needed in order to vaccinate the world. So I'm curious to hear from you all to see what role digital can play in speeding up um, this rollout. Perhaps um, we go to New York for that one. Sure, happy to take that. So, in fact, this is basically what we do now. That This is that the key question that keeps us busy morning to evening. Um, UNICEF is obviously one of the main partners in the supply and procurement of the COVID vaccines. And we, um, we're committed to now supporting the countries to, to really get their vaccination rates up. And one of the things that we established earlier this year and it kind of links to Carolyn's point she made earlier is um, how do we make sure that we collaborate around the support to countries to really make sure that they have the systems in place to be able to monitor their vaccine rollout and, and support all the systems needed digital systems data management platforms needed to to create sort of a an environment where the, the delivery of the vaccine is efficient, but also equitable. And so um, this is when, through the support of the German government and, and other donors, we established a mechanism called the Digital Health Center of Excellence, so the DICE, which really has a primary aim to support the COVID vaccine rollout um, by availing sort of flexible and, and, and surge support to countries who need technical assistance who need some sort of quick investments to be able to make their to improve their systems their digital systems and health information systems for this purpose and um, through this mechanism it's it's a collaboration between WHO and UNICEF where UNICEF lead the day-to-day -day operations we're able to now support many countries we get initially we get requests almost on a daily basis to come in and and sort of provide some expertise, um, leveraging existing partners' expertise, leveraging other donors who work in this space, or even just helping the countries to access donor funding for these platforms. And what we see is that the, the requests that are coming in, countries are ahead of us in many ways. They are already thinking about how can they improve the systems that they have to not only address COVID, but also be set up in a way that they can um, sort of collect data on maternal and child health in the future. So they're already at the point where they're thinking about how they can sort of ride on this COVID wave of investments to improve their platforms. And, and we've seen um, a gap here in, in the collaboration between partners and donors around this type of support. So this is what we're hoping to achieve through the DICE. 
and so far it's been it's been uh, incredibly well received because I think everyone has acknowledged that there is a gap in how we really operationalize these digital investment donor investment principles that we have um, uh, had in place for a long time but we haven't really been able to to um, operationalize at country level so um, one of the I mean we do, we do see a lot of now requests to, to fix the systems that were quickly set up in the beginning of COVID. How do we get a system that collects surveillance data on COVID with a system that collects vaccine data on COVID? Because oftentimes you can actually not look at data at country level on does the vaccine rate relate to the COVID cases going down? Because those, those data sits in different platforms, in different data silos. And so a lot of our support, the, the request that we are now getting is to kind of fix these issues and create systems that are more interoperable and, and that can exchange data in, in better ways. Okay. And Rachel, I'd like to also get your perspective on, on that. Of course, you're joining us today um, from Johannesburg, from South Africa. And just a month ago, it seemed like the pandemic there was under control until, of course, the arrival of Omicron. But on that point as well, Remind us how the variant was detect detected quite quickly in South Africa due to the pretty robust um, genomic sequencing program. Yes, so the, I think for me, this is an excellent example of the importance of developing the technology, you know, investing in that capacity building, even before we find ourselves in a situation such as the pandemic. Uh, two of the examples I gave earlier, you know, showed how existing tools were able to be adapted and used very quickly to respond to the pandemic. So in South Africa, there's been capacity built, you know, through a number of investments over time uh, to do genomic sequencing. And so they routinely use that surveillance uh, to track the trajectory of the pandemic. And they were able to, you know, uh, sequence some samples, which led to the detection of, of the Omicron variant. And one of the challenges, though, that I think, uh, you know, I, I, is important as we talk about the future and our response, you know, as a global community, is the reaction that they got when they were able to detect uh, the Omicron variant. And, you know, it is a disincentive, uh, while at the same time we're trying to encourage them uh, to learn these new technologies, to deploy them. Uh, for the benefit, not just of the country, but of, you know, the global community. If we get the kind of responses that took place, I think it's a disincentive and it's important as we move forward. I think we're in other communities, you know, other communities speak to the importance of collaboration. And I cannot emphasize enough um, how important this is. And also in the context of being able to use technology in a way that speaks to a particular local context. Um, it's, I think, you know, we, we know that there are some unique differences, even as we build that global architecture um, that will allow us to have, you know, the interoperability, the, you know, collective response on the ground, um, we need to be able to have those nuances uh, that allow us to have a much more effective response. Thanks. And Rachel, just moving away from COVID-19 for a minute and elaborating a bit more on what Bernard said earlier, can you talk us through your first-hand experience there in South Africa with digital solutions overseeing programs on health systems and, and human resources? Um, let me share with you an example from a while back in my career uh, when I was working in Lesotho uh, in the early days of the HIV AIDS pandemic. And at the time, Lesotho didn't have the capacity to do uh, DNA PCR. And so what we had to do was do a mix of motorbike riders, collecting samples from health facilities in the mountains, you know, using DHL to send the samples to the National Health Lab in South Africa. And then using just basic technology, email in databases, to be able to get the results back to the health facility in time for the mother's six week, well, the baby's uh, six week checkup um, to just, you know, know their HIV results. And that was you know, too rewarding, right? In the health center, seeing the mother's face light up when the results come back, and she knows she's been through it successfully. 
So there's very basic technology that, you know, has been used in the past and a lot of potential to build on that and to strengthen, you know, our health responses and health systems generally. Okay, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, let's bring in Professor Krause there, who's been listening along. Um, it's, you're a massive panel, there's six of you, so if anyone does have anything to say at any stage, give a little wave and I can see you all perfectly. So feel free to jump in if there's anything that you really want to, to say. Um, but Professor Krause, I wanted to ask you about uh, digital public goods and what you're doing to reach those standards. Um, well, we already reached them. <laughs> so actually, we're quite proud that SOMAS was the first digital tool in the digital square context that reached the 100% of the criteria for the digital global goods and health uh, digital systems. And also recently, UNICEF has confirmed that uh, SOMAS um, has complied with all the digital goods criteria. And how did we reach it? Um, we identified it quite early as a, an important uh, guideline. And we prioritized all our activities uh, way back from 2015 on, 16 on, along those guidelines. And so we prioritized our activities. We acquired grants to actually make this uh, compatible. And uh, that has helped us a lot, really. I think part of the success of SOMAS is due to the fact that we have had that as a priority in our development. Okay. Bernhard, were you trying to jump in there? Yeah, no, it's in, because you were asking us like, what could be solutions, right? And like maybe just reference the call for applications that were just made for this digital health accelerator. These were actually in, in four areas. One was in data collection, planning, vaccine delivery, but and also like the waste management. The second area was in areas of like awareness, misinformation, community engagement. The third area about like, you know, safety monitoring and also like if there's adverse effects after immunization. And the fourth is uh, vaccine monitoring. And like right now in that accelerator program, we're actually looking to, you know, there's already like a short list of really, really exciting solutions that have traction in local or regional, uh, um, you know, uh, basis. And, you know, the next step there will be to try to really either add more elements of like open source elements or try if they have already been open source, how can we expand them further? So like to really push those types of solutions. But I, I really want to say it because like what uh, uh, Gerard was saying is like, these are the types of examples that we need to look at. These are the you know the inspiration for things that works things that should be replicated and it can actually also have more impact across the globe okay and caroline bonsbach i'd like to bring in you there you've been quiet there for a couple of minutes so sorry about that and can you give us some examples of innovative solutions that you've been working on yeah let me maybe start um by explaining a little bit how the the, the german development um, approach um uh is um yeah, is um, realized. So, for for Germany, the digital health um, aspect is very central in the global health um, uh, initiatives, and uh, digitalization is one of the core topic of the German global health strategy. So, Germany since long already has taken a system-based approach on health and focusing on health system strengthening as a whole. So, um, it, that comes also with the principle of digital by default, and German Development Corporation also GIZ supports partner countries and regions in implementation of numerous digital health approaches. Let me maybe um, come back to SOMAS. Um, Gerard has mentioned already SOMAS. Um, it has been developed um, uh, in the case of the um, uh, pandemic um, uh, during the uh, Ebola outbreak and has really um, been developed into a major and highly useful digital public good. Um, to effectively support epidemic surveillance and outbreak management. So GIZ is supporting the rollout of SOMAS in various countries and regions, such as, for example, the ECOWAS and EGAD regions, um, as well as on country level, and also co-financed by the EU Commission. And this is also one signal, like we can share hands to upscale really um, uh, those solutions who really work well. Um, on the other hand, Karen and um, and uh, Bernhard already mentioned uh, the, 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 the DICE um, approach and the, the accelerator approach. Uh, there, GIZ um, has joined hands too, for example. So um, we do implement a local pillar uh, regarding the digital innovation for pandemic control um, uh, project, where we uh, take a closer look at um, 
the, the digital pandemic preparedness assessment. So the idea is to identify gaps and opportunities in the digital health landscape in a country and uh, to ensure that these findings feed into the national policy planning. So um, overall, um, we, we, we find out how to really um, uh, get down to a needs-based approach um, and to close gaps uh, through innovation in this regard. A needs-based approach. Okay, thank you so much. And Lorena, I'd just like to get your perspective on the pharma sector here uh, in Europe. If you believe that they are digital ready. Well, I think that uh, they are not in a bad shape. Huh? We see in particular, as I was mentioning before, huh, how uh, uh, quickly uh, the vaccine was uh, discovered, uh, also in terms of medicaments. Uh, I mean, they have been using uh, technologies uh, to be able to do these. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, we've seen that uh, they are able to use uh, technologies. Uh, of course, there was a lot of uh, investment behind, <laughs> uh, very quick and rapid investment at that moment. Uh, so that <laughs> investments are needed uh, if you want to use uh, technologies at large scale and Quickly. Uh, but I think that, of course, uh, uh, there, is, there are other uh, fields where pharma, the pharmaceutical companies can use technologies, not only to invent and discover medicaments, but also uh, in terms of, of uh, improving distribution uh, in the supply chain of the pharmaceutical industry. So, and, and this is something where what we are working uh, Karin was mentioning before uh, for the distribution of vaccines, also uh, using technologies to, to improve distribution and the supply chain is also a field that certainly we still need to work uh, work with. Okay, and Mr. Professor Kaiser, do you have anything to say on that? I know the Novartis, for example, were able to respond to the lockdown quite fast, so they've been investing in digital initiatives for years ahead of the pandemic. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> My apologies. There have been many digital initiatives now for the past two decades, but I think really now um, they have been so accelerated. Um, but I do see a problem that also Bernard mentioned a little bit, the problem of interfaces. Uh, many of those initiatives go in parallel. There's uh, so many hacker firms that have been established and According to my assessment, I think most of them have not really led to sustainable, uh, scalable tools. Um, many more promises have been attached to them that they could be fulfilled. And then there's a lot of parallel systems now competing to each other, which is maybe good to have some competition, but it also creates confusion, it creates redundancy, and it creates uh, friction that we cannot afford in a pandemic situation. So it would really be better to invest thoroughly in this digitalization activities before the outbreak, before the pandemic, and have them then up and running before the epidemic comes. Uh, that we need to learn from that for the next time. Because I've been through major outbreaks in the past, the 2009 pandemic, the EHEC outbreak and so on. And every time we made assessments and evaluations and every time we concluded we need to increase and, and improve digitalization. And we find ourselves now again in a situation caught by surprise. Yeah, I imagine you've been probably attending conferences all around the world for the last couple of decades, convening with your colleagues and other immunologists about the possibility that a pandemic would come. But yeah, it still took us all um, by surprise. Caroline Bansbach, I think you want to jump in there. Caroline? Did Not for the moment, thank you. No, you didn't raise your hand. So, was it Karen Callender? Sorry, you were raising your hand. No, I, I um, yeah, I just wanted to sort of add to the, the, the conversation around, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up the conversation around digital public goods here, because one of the things we we did see that was different during this pandemic than from previous epidemics is that since there has been quite a big push for, for global goods solutions, for open source products, the, the, the donors and investors and platform owners were quite quickly able to sort of make the investments needed to adapt these systems for COVID, which made the rollout process very speedy and, and not too challenging at country levels because they were already familiar with these platforms. And I think we 
it was very much thanks to previous investments in digital public good solutions. Not Sorma is not to say that as is a great example, but many other solutions as well. And what what was kind of interesting though during um, this this pandemic was that there were many new use cases of products that we had never expected that we would be missing. Scheduling systems, you know, registration and scheduling systems. I don't think there were many countries in the world who could launch a vaccine scheduling platform that didn't crash after two hours. We saw it from the US to Australia. And, and we had no digital public good solution to, to set up vaccine scheduling. And it was actually taking us by a big surprise. And um, what we have seen, thankfully, is that many of the solutions have now become available in the space and seem to be robust and seem to be working. But I think just thinking ahead also um, for the future, what we also need to invest in more is the linkages between digital public goods. We are now seeing many countries who are going from routine sort of delivery of the COVID vaccine at health facilities to now need it to do vaccine, vaccinodromes as they call them. They call, they put football stadiums into vaccine centers and they will vaccinate thousands of people in a day. So the systems and solutions that were developed for health facilities won't work in a situation where you have such a load of people. And all of a sudden we need to think of very simple SMS based solutions to report data on a daily basis and how do we get SMS data into a health information system platform. So what we now need to really think uh, about when we move forward with investments in digital public goods is how do we make those connectors and how do we create them before countries need to invest to set them up and, and so that we don't see the risk is otherwise we see a lot of vaccines expiring because they cannot sort of get them out in time and how we make sure that we have the products and solutions needed. So this innovative process is still happening. We're not done after 18 months. We see new challenges every day. We're not done and that's exactly why we're here to discuss it. Bernard or uh, Rachel, do you have anything that you would like to, to bring in there to react? Sure. Just to... Sorry. Rachel, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, just to, to really agree with that in terms of the importance of making the investments up front um, the, you know, while we have been able to respond, the inefficiencies um, and the additional resources that have been expended as a result could have been used you know, for, for other needs. So when the challenge comes, we will respond. Um, and it's much better if we can be much more intentional and much more deliberate, uh, take the time to foster the collaborations and the partnerships that are needed uh, in order to be able to get those outcomes. And really, you know, as Karen said, to link them in a way um, to system, to create systems that are suitable, you know, longer term and not, they can be used to respond to pandemics, but at the same time for the long term, uh, they're much more uh, fit for purpose. For purpose, and of course, putting the patient uh, first. Bernard, what, would you like to react to that? Yeah, no. It, uh, it just to add, actually, what Rachel and Karen were saying, like this is uh, exactly the point here. It's not just about technology. It's not just about gadgets. It's about also how do you actually create impact. So it's about how do you actually make it happen. What's the scaling strategy? How do you lead to adoption by people, by you know doctors, healthcare workers? Like how do you actually make this scaling pathway? And I think this is oftentimes overlooked. It's not just that tool. You also need to think about like. Uh, that you know what how do you actually create that type of adoption and I think the teams and innovations and tools that embody this already I think those will be the ones that are most successful and you know in in from the experience that we've had in like scaling innovation like this is you can't start early enough about like how do you scale these types of things because it's one thing to have the technology but you then also need to think about like the development and the investment you need to actually make it happen like is it training? Is it then again a digital program that actually trains people? Um, of course, it's something that ideally you know scales by itself. But it's I and but this is also something where I, I you know Gerard was also mentioning this. You know, innovating during the pandemic is inherently hard. But like 
it's needed and necessary. So, but oftentimes what we've seen also is that, you know, it's innovation that may have started for different reasons that all of a sudden because of the pandemic are very, very relevant right now with benefits that we had never anticipated. Like, and I, I, we've seen this for uh, in innovation in our food space, for instance, that we call eShop in Somalia. It's kind of home delivery, uh, Uber Eats for vulnerable population that order food online, you know, and it's something that was started before the pandemic, but during the pandemic, it all of a sudden became very, very relevant. And I think these are the types of things we shouldn't forget when we think about innovation. And just on personal uh, use of apps and gadgets, can you raise your hands, panelists, if you use um, the health app on your phone to track your data to see how many steps you've done in the day? Just curious about your own personal usage. Five out of... So, Professor Kaiser, you don't. Tell us why. Um, because um, of technical data protection reasons, really. <laughs> yes. Um, now, we have been in our tool under so much data protection scrutiny um, uh, that really makes our work very difficult, but I think that hardens our tool. Um, but through that, I've also learned on what to look out for, so that's why I'm a bit resilient here in this space. <laughs> Indeed, and in Germany, I know it's a topic, um, a very yeah. topic close to your hearts there in Germany. And just while I have you there, Professor, can you just very briefly, briefly talk about the role of telemedicine, whether you think it's, it's here to stay with us? Can you rephrase, please? I didn't quite get the context. Yeah, I want to ask you, well, we're talking here about um, digital health. So one of the things that I think of is the rise of telemedicine and how countries have been using it during the lockdowns when there was high surges of infections. So as opposed to physically going to your doctor. Okay. Um, as, a, as a physician that I myself, I believe, you know, close contact is important to assess a clinical picture. And we should not as underestimate it. Of course, with um, telemedicine and pictures and so on, you can cover quite a bit. And of course, it makes things more efficient, uh, especially it reduces the risk of infection. So we have to learn from that. I have to learn for that and adapt myself to this concept. Um, but we must also make sure there is, especially in, this resp in those respiratory diseases, um, the exacerbation can be very, very fast. And you can come to a point where you miss the point of uh, of rapid and 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 um, and timely treatment to prevent uh, further uh, the exacerbation of the disease. So it's not easy to answer whether I find it all good or all bad. Um, also, I don't have personal experience with it, so I must also disclaim this yeah. this limitation of my of my assessment. Very interesting to hear your thoughts on it. Now we've time for just one question from our audience. It's quite a specific question. And I think perhaps it might be from Lorena, from our representative from the European Commission. So uh, Lorena, if you just listen up for what could be the last question of the panel, because time is running out. Um, and the question is from an audience member who did not provide their name, but thank you for the question. It says, new disruptive players enable patients with lack of mobility to access medicine by offering a same day delivery from local pharmacies but prescribed medicine are not allowed to be purchased through this channel, whereas it's key, they say, for socially and physically vulnerable populations. When and how is the legal framework going to change this? So, Lorena, we can tackle that question. I'm not sure if you can say much. I'm not sure it's a digital question. It is, a, is more a question about whether prescribed medicine is something that uh, should be available for social and physical populations. So it's more, I would say, for national health authorities to decide whether it's a good thing or, or, or not. So uh, I do not feel myself so concerned by it, but uh, uh, but I, I wanted to, because it, in a way it's, it's, it's a bit uh, link uh, with lack of mobility of people. I wanted to jump on the question before to, to, to uh, get out on, on, uh, on telemedicine. Um, because uh, for me, it has been a major revolution of the, of the COVID pandemic. I've seen my mother, who has a certain age, being delighted of being able to be still in contact with uh, her uh, practitioner uh, and honestly solve many issues uh, without putting herself or the doctor at risk. And she is of a certain age, so uh, honestly, we are not talking here about millennials uh, using uh, 
it has, but it changed the life of many old people that really could move. So I think that uh, is one of the very positive things that I should have mentioned, by the way, in my opening, uh, because that's here to stay. That's here to stay. Then, of course, there are certain situations where I mean, you need the, the contact, you need to be there. But when that is not really necessary, if you are really, really making the life of people of certain age, or, uh, and I leave it to the person here, that are lacking mobility to, to really facilitate that. Uh, okay. Perhaps it's um, worth another panel debate on that topic. It's definitely a very interesting one, which I'm sure you all have interesting perspectives on. But Lorena um, Boalonso, the director there at TG Connect, uh, thank you very much for that. And thank you also to Bernard Kowach from uh, Innovation Accelerator at the UN's World Food Programme. Thanks for joining us. Also, Karen Callender, thank you. Uh, Rachel Tokwapaya, thank you so much. It was great to hear your insights. Also, Caroline Bansbach, thanks for being with us. And then Professor Gerard Kauza, thanks for joining us. It was great to hear all your perspectives. Thanks, of course, to all our viewers. Uh, that almost brings uh, the European uh, Health Summit to an end. So I wish you all a wonderful afternoon. Stay, take, stay safe, take care, and hope to see you again perhaps next year. Bye-bye.
Thanks so much. It's a very good thing.